Welcome to Punks for Progress Weekly What the Fuck Report. I'm Punker Mike. That's Reverend Aaron. Hey, bro. Hey, dude. What the fuck? Um, well, let's see. Uh, it's, uh, it's another fucking week in paradise, bro. I mean, come on. We got so much to talk about. It's only been a damn week. We do. We actually have a hell of a lot to talk about. So I'm going to I'll give you guys a quick rundown of what we're going to talk about and uh, on today's show. So let's see, man. We're going to cover um, uh, Bernie at the Women's March and the whole fiasco surrounding that. We're going to talk about Trump's uh, executive care on Obama, uh, executive order on Obamacare. We're going to talk about Marino, the proposed drug czar, and his connections to Big Pharma. We're going to talk a, a, a hell of a lot about the Santa Rosa fires and, and, and the different fires going on in California. We're going to get into Puerto Rico. We're going to talk about... Um, Jesus, Trump's just babbling idiotic mouth in relation to what happened in Niger. We're going to get into Iran and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, there, I mean, we have a lot of stuff on today's show. Um, why don't we um, – we also have an interview that I did uh, this last week with the uh, um, people from the Animal Rights Center in Berkeley. And I went and talked right. to them because, uh, as a lot of our regular listeners will know, um, during Milo's Free Speech Week, <clears throat> um, and the repeated attacks on Revolution Books, um, the people from the Animal Rights Center were repeatedly there. Each time these attacks happened, they came and bam, they were right there standing locked arm. And, and I, so I just went and talked to them and um, one, thanked them for that. And then um, they agreed to do an interview and kind of talk about how they were so readily prepared to, to do that. So um, we have that interview. So um why don't we go ahead and play that, bro? And um, and then we'll come back and we'll really get into uh, our weekly What the Fuck report. Uh, let's play a public service announcement real quick first, shall we? I like that idea. Let's do it. I like this one. It's a very Food Not Bombs-esque sort of uh, yeah. sentiment behind what? it. I mean, it's obviously not about Food Not Bombs, but it gets to the root of kind of where Food Not Bombs is right. coming from. Right. One of the reasons I liked it. Cool. So let's do that. We'll play that PSA and that interview with the Animal Rights Center in Berkeley, and then we'll come back and get into it. Guess what? I have some news for you. There's free food right there, junk food. You see that truck? Oh, jeez. It's a two Michelin star chef. All for free, ladies and gentlemen. All for free. Here we have a panzanella with summer vegetables and pesto. Enjoy. Okay. How are we doing? So what do you got going on underneath that plate there? This food is really about to be thrown away. Yeah. Is there, is there something wrong with this food? Where did you get it from? From farmer's markets. They put aside the ugly vegetables and the ugly fruits. Carrot top, soft avocados. It was all food that was going to be discarded. Even the drink you had is made from like a little bruised peach. Did it taste a little like bruised? Great. It was good. The average person throws away 24 pounds of food a month. That's a lot. Isn't that a lot? Go visit savethefood.com for more information. Thank you. looks like we're going to come and get all the fucking communists. No more commies! No more commies! No more commies! No more commies! Okay, I'm here with Matt from the Berkeley Animal Rights Center. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what the Berkeley Animal Rights Center is, a little bit of its history, and then we'll get into a little bit of things that you guys do. Awesome, thanks. So the Berkeley Animal Rights Center has been around for right around a year now, and it's actually the first community center for animal rights um, in the entire Western Hemisphere. So we're really proud of that fact. And this is a, a community space that has a, a vegan store and, and animal rights related apparel. It's a community space for uh, animal rights groups of pretty much any stripe within, you know, within our basic framework of values to come together and to have um, events like speaking events, organize protests, um, organize community events, sanctuary work days, all sorts of things. 
And it's all kind of centered around this idea that we want Berkeley to lead the United States on animal rights issues and concluding with our ultimate goal here in Berkeley, see it right here, uh, our goal is to ban all violence towards animals by 2025, so Ban Me to Berkeley is kind of the, the rallying cry of the moment. Okay guys, why don't you go ahead and give me your names. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm Almira. Okay, so I'm there from here at the Berkeley Animal Rights Center, and um, they're going to give us kind of a rundown of um, their experience with the fascist assault, the week-long fascist assault on Revolution Books. They were both there. Paul, you were there one of the days, and Almira, you were there more than once. So um, I'll just kind of let you take it from there. Why don't you give us your take on your experience? Actually, why don't you start out by telling us kind of how you came aware that it was happening? and how you were able to mobilize and get it together to be there for them. Yeah, well, um, you know, we're in the same little mall area as Revolution Books, so we know the people, you know, a little bit who volunteer and work there, so we're aware of kind of the things that are happening, and we were aware of the, I guess, like, they're calling it the free speech week that was happening on campus, aware of, like, some of the speakers that were coming, and um, we had heard a little bit about some, uh, some, like, clashes that had happened earlier on the day. This was the Sunday. Um, but we actually had an event here that was already planned, which was a training that we were doing, uh, ironically, or I guess like, you know, a good thing was we were doing a training on how to respond um, during protests and how to prepare ourselves for protests. So we were here doing this training and someone from Revolution Books came over, you know, kind of looking pretty scared actually and asked us if we could come and help her. Um, you know, because uh, the fascists were coming back to the bookstore, so we were like, well, this is great, um, you know, use of our training, we're going to go over and kind of just basically be in solidarity with the people who were there, um, just as support and as a presence to show them, you know, the fascists that they weren't going to be able to just kind of walk on right through into the bookstore and, like, harass people. So that's what happened on the first day. We basically stood there for a while, um, you know, silently until they eventually left, um, but... Yeah, I think that was caught on video, and it was a good practice for our people to not kind of, um, I guess, like engage with some of the ridiculous things, hateful things that the people there were saying. So what you're telling me is that you worked with the fascists ahead of time to plan this whole thing so that you could have proper training uh, and, no, and tactical. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. But it was a good exercise, you know, real sure. life. Um, sure. And as people will see, I'll put some video in over this, that you, uh, your presence was fabulous and you remained stern and just held your ground and, and steady and consistent and it really made all the difference and allowed them to sort of say all the ridiculous things that they said yeah. and all the incriminating things that they said because you wouldn't respond. And I'm, I'm, and I'm a responder. I have to engage. I, I get into it with them and it's... So it takes. So t so tell me a little bit about your take on it, Paul. On well, uh, on the day you're talking about, I was actually in Oakland at the East Point Peace Academy, finishing up the fourth day of a four-day um, nonviolence training, like uh, being trained to be a, a, a trainer of Kingian nonviolence. And uh, we saw the videos, and like in our group chat and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then uh, the next day, Monday, we were here, and uh, the Rev Brooks folks came, and they were like, hey. Uh, word is like you know they're going to come back and try to attack us again, and you know sure enough they did. Uh, we went uh, down there and just sort of formed a peaceful wall. And uh, my friend Chase is here now too. He was sort of standing in between, um, like you know one of the uh, all right people who was like hurling insults and trying to sort of antagonize you know members of Revolution Books. So Chase just nonviolently took a position, you know calmly there, and uh, and then Amir actually suggested, hey, you should maybe back Chase up, and so myself and four or five others went and just sort of formed a nice wall there and let them just hurl their insults and make their threats. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it, was, it was fine. It's like, you know, what we're trying to do is we, wanna, um, we don't want to use violence to combat violence in this sense. I know that, you know, some people you know, don't have that privilege and need to defend themselves in different ways, but in this situation, we certainly wanted to just de-escalate the situation and just help keep our friends with our books safe from that attack. So, yeah, so, I mean, there's the first day, there's the second day, third day, fourth day, and you guys were there every day. But I kind of want to hear a little bit about the aftermath of it and, and, and how a community sort of deals with this after. Because it's not over now that this buffoon and his monkey parade of online YouTubers isn't behind him. They're, they're not here, they're gone. But maybe you could talk a little bit about how, the, how you deal with the aftermath of it. Yeah, I mean, we have a really strong community here of people who really care about each other and support each other. And so, you know, when something like that happens, it definitely affects 
um, individual people differently, like depending on you know how privileged of a person you are. Like it might not be like that big of a deal for like people like you know Paul and myself um, who have a lot of privilege. But there are other people in our community who it might be a lot you know scarier for, and so we all have to kind of support each other and make sure people know that there's places to go where they can be safe and talk about their experiences and. Um, yeah, you know, they, they don't have, they shouldn't, you know, or we're trying our best to make people have a space where they don't need to be afraid of, of being targeted just for like kind of who they are. Yeah, well said. Excellent. So if you guys have any closing thoughts or anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think, you know, it's really important that we all stick together, people who are working for social justice on all different fronts. You know, we're animal rights activists first and foremost, but humans are also animals and you know, if all of the people who are, you know, progressive and fighting for a better world, if we all work together, like, that's when we're really going to be extremely powerful, because we are the majority, and um, the, we don't want to let this, like, you know, minority of people who are promoting hate kind of win, so, yeah. Yeah, well said. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, you're And welcome. thank you so much for your help at uh, Revolution Books, too. That was just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Mm, look awesome. at that amazing picture right there. <laughs> Designed by one of our activists. Kitty Jones, painted by Kitty and also Tiffany over there. Beautiful. <laughs> so. Thank you, guys. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's a community space for uh, animal rights groups of pretty much any stripe within, you know, within our basic framework of values to come together and to have um, events like speaking events, organize protests, um, organize community events, sanctuary work days, all sorts of things. And it's all kind of centered around this idea that we want Berkeley to lead the United States on animal rights issues and including with our ultimate goal here in Berkeley, see it right here, uh, our goal is to ban all violence towards animals by 2025. So Ban Me in Berkeley is kind of the, the rallying cry at the moment. Excellent. So you must have all kinds of things in the works to achieve those goals. Why don't you Absolutely. give us a little rundown of what so, the Berkeley Animal Rights Center has in, in uh Definitely. So Coming I'm up. also an organizer with the Direct Action Everywhere. This is a global grassroots animal rights network. So there's um, chapters all over the country and even around the world. We have some chapters in, in Canada, in Europe, and uh, in, in a few in South America. And, but the Bay Area is, is kind of the most active and founding chapter of Direct Action Everywhere, and we're really excited for coming up uh, next weekend. Uh, well, I don't know when that's going to be released, but October 20th to 22nd, um, we have our DXC, uh, Direct Action Everywhere, DXC is short for that, Convergence, and this is a three-day event. Um, some of the highlights include Ingrid Newkirk, the founder of PETA, kind of the most prominent person in animal rights history. Uh, is going to be here and speaking. We're going to have an official animal rights march. Uh, so this is going to be, uh, we're shooting for a thousand people. It's certainly going to be several hundred people marching through the streets of Berkeley, the largest animal rights gathering in the history of Berkeley. So we're really excited about that. We also have uh, a very exciting action happening on Sunday uh, for security culture reasons. I won't release the details now, but maybe by the time this comes out, you'll be able to update that. It's going to be something that's very exciting and in, in some ways a historic moment of the animal rights movement. And one more uh, highlight of that weekend is open rescue training. So what we do as activists with Direct Action Everywhere, one thing we do is what's called open rescue. And this is a tactic um, where we go inside of farms, inside of places of violence in the middle of the night. Um, we infiltrate these places, we document conditions, we rescue sick and injured animals, we take them to a vet and then to sanctuary, and then we sh tell the whole world exactly what we did. We proudly show our faces. We say, hey, we're on the side of justice. We're on the side of compassion and nonviolence. If these corporations want to brand us criminals, if they want to come after us, like, let's have it out in court. And, and so far, this work is spreading far and wide, and this is an opportunity for anybody who's interested to kind of learn the ins and outs of how to get involved, how to form a team, research, execution, press, legal, kind of everything you need to know with this open rescue that we're trying to spread into a mass movement of civil disobedience. Excellent. So tell us how to uh, find you, get a hold of you, donate to you, yeah. uh, whatever it uh, is. Awesome. So uh, for the, as far as the Berkeley Animal Rights Center, it's berkeleyarc.com. 
Direct Action Everywhere is just directactioneverywhere.com. Uh, we have a uh, really active presence on Facebook in particular uh, with both of those things. So if you Facebook search Berkeley Animal Rights Center or Direct Action Everywhere, uh, SF Bay area uh, is our very active chapter within that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks. Okay, so the, uh, that's my interview um, with the people from the Animal Rights Center in Berkeley. Um, um, you know, obviously, I gave them the opportunity to plug a bunch of the events that they have coming up. Um, I just want to say kind of a funny little story, bro, about uh, my, one of my first interactions with them was um, uh, during one of the organizing meetings I attended for the November 4th march and demonstration. Um, and um, a couple of the representatives came in support and they wanted to, you know, um, participate in um, setting up this November 4th call to action. And um, they showed up and they said, OK, hey, you know, we're from the Animal Rights Center. Da, 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 and we just like to request that um, for us, you know, um, for the remainder of the meeting, if anyone um, could refrain from consuming any type of um, animal or animal product or byproduct. And I had like a drink with some cream in it. And there were some people who were eating like takeout food that they had gotten and stuff and like with meat in it. And um, my instant reaction was super on the defensive. Like I didn't say anything right off the bat. But my first thought was, oh, fuck. You didn't tell me what to fucking eat and not eat. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, uh, I didn't react that way. Um, but uh, so I, I did um, actually say, OK, hey, check it out. This is my take. Like, I respect where you're coming from, and um, but the bottom line is I'm here to help see about organizing a demonstration against the Trump and Pence regime, and um, I have cream in my drink, and I'm going to continue to drink it and participate in this meeting. And then I'm like, no offense, but, you know, and a couple other people said, you know, um, yeah, I kind of want to eat my food, too, <laughs> and this is the only chance I have to eat and do this, and, you know, um, and I really expected them – to then go, all right, well, thanks anyway, and then get up and leave. And if they did that, I had fully intended on confronting them about it. But they didn't. They stayed. They spoke their piece. And the way and my, my afterthought on it was that I actually had a shit ton of respect for them because this is their belief. This is a, a thing that's core and central to them and what motivates them to be active. And they really, really believe in it. And whether I agree with it or not is aside from the point um, – they had the integrity to make the request, right? And um, but then didn't um, you know come down on us negatively for not acquiescing to their request and for having our own individual perspectives on things. But they made it clear where they come from, and I'm sure they probably look at it like, <clears throat> I know this is true. Like, um, I had to be confronted with the fact that there was a mass-produced animal byproduct in the drink. I think I was consuming in that moment even for a brief moment. I was like, mm, you know, and that doesn't feel good knowing that you're contributing to that in a large way. And my, and my ultimate take, and then I won't, I've rambled on a little, kind of a lot already, but my ultimate take with a lot of this stuff is yes, I'm a meat eater, but I do have, um, I do fear, feel serious bits of guilt, Mike, that like, I know the way um, cows are treated in our mass dairy, you know, industrial complex and, chickens and animals and just the way it's so disgusting yeah. the whole entire industry Fact and farming. right thank you that's what i was looking for and so in a way i kind of appreciated that they took that stand and made and kind of confronted us and made us all kind of think about it for a second but in the end they stayed and participated in the meeting so i had respect for them for that and then for them to come out and stand by these people you know they stood by their own community that's what it was about it's not like they stood by the the communists who run a bookstore it's this is our community this is berkeley that was their you know their, their take on it so they stood there with them and so i i, I personally was really, really appreciative because we were so outnumbered especially that first attack on the store and um so to have them come and, and be so like kind of professional in the way they did it and and to handle their shit so well and stand by us i think really stopped it from um that mob going further and doing any type of harm.
And so anyway, thank you to everyone from the uh, Berkeley Animal Rights Center. And, and we can get into some other stuff, bro. Like, for instance, um, <laughs> Democracy Now! did a, a great story today about uh, it came out. Some official papers and stuff have been released and um, that Indonesia in the 60s, the Indonesian government, the U.S. backed Indonesian um Government. Well, the U.S. backed a coup in Indonesia and overturned the dem democratically elected government of Indonesia and installed a freaking military um, dictator. And in that process, it, we now know that hundreds of thousands of people were massacred in mass. Yeah, you know, it was just uh, a gnarly, gnarly, gnarly crime against humanity. And uh, um, the officials in, that were related to and working with in America with the Indonesian government and the they praised it. They actually, that, that's what came out in Democracy Now! was that um, the American military was stoked on it. They loved that they did this massacre. <laughs> like, good job. And it's all backed because, you know, um, of all the propaganda about anti communism and all that fucking bullshit. So it's okay to, you know, mass murder people in the 60s. You know, this is under the Johnson administration. <laughs> Yeah, so, no, no, I, 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 I agree. It's, it's just proof that, you know, what we've known all along that our government um, supports coups to overthrow democratically elected governments, and this is, right. you know, one of those that when we were young, well, you weren't even bored yet, were you? Um, but I was just, I was just a young thing, had no idea, selling my finger up my butt. I didn't know what the hell was going on, right? And and my government is, is backing overthrowing democratically elected governments I and installing we were fucking to... military dictators right i thought we were supposed to spread democracy i thought that's kind of what the you know the american thing was right it's such a great fucking thing we're spreading around the world it's capitalism we were spreading not democracy right and you know and, and it all ties back to i'm sure our regular listeners are well aware of john perkins um um uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, but if you're not, that's an excellent book to get your hands on to re to really understand this ongoing history of um, just um, overthrowing of military governments for the sake of raping that community's resources for big, giant, Western-based multinational corporations. And so this is, you know, just yet another example, but this one attached to a real massacre of just thousands and thousands of people, man. It's just... So anyway, you know, this day in history, right? But um, so, you know, domestically and in modern times, there's other things that were going on. And apparently everyone's completely lost their shit because Bernie Sanders was asked to talk at a women's march. Uh, Holy talk. crap. Before we go on too much, I do want to say something that you reminded me of today in history. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, uh, October 18th, the Clean Water Act's 45th anniversary. So say goodbye because, you know, that's on fucking that's on Pruitt's hit list oh Pruitt's not there anymore <laughs> it's so hard to keep up with who's, who I know still who's EPA I can't remember anyway yeah but it's on their hit list they're gonna get they're trying to get the clean water act but yeah today 40 it was signed 45 years ago so anyway um yeah so my understanding is that I'm, and I've read quite a few articles about this and I'll tell my little story and if you want me to unless you want to you got more to say about this but no I don't I, I to be honest man I don't want to talk about this at all <laughs> so we have to tread so lightly people I have really really like flipped out kind of stuck their flag in the ground on this issue they're like no this one this is the thing and and it's not that it's not important and not that it's not an important discussion to have. I mean, give me a break. It's um, on the face of it. It looks like, you know, Bernie Sanders, a male, is the main guy at the Women's March thing. And if that's if that's truly the case, I have to agree that that would be wildly inappropriate. Why would a man be the, you know, but, you know, for starters, they're um, they asked Hillary. They asked um, Elizabeth Warren and they asked Kamala Harris. They Before did. And they, they all three Bernie. declined. They all, they all three declined. Right. Yes, and he's not the head he keynote speaker, dude. He's the guy that speaks on the first night. Okay, he's like, that's right. He's um, like the first night the speaker. I don't even know who the – oh, wait a minute. I do know. It's Maxine Waters. Yeah, Maxine Waters is actually – And she's the, a congressman uh, here from California. Right. And she's very vocal, and she's, she, she's pretty progressive. I still believe she's heavily uh, into the establishment. But, well, right. Um, 
this is a total heavily established, established. <laughs> right no right. this is all an establishment well event, this so, you know this you thing know. was all organized by the people from the women's march okay so right. apparently they hit at bernie sanders and he was like yeah and and so here's the about the article i read first of all that was the first thing i was going to say is they asked hillary she's out on a book tour she don't give a fucking shit guys she's right. selling her book that's what she's fucking doing right now whining and crying why she ain't in the white house all right <clears throat> they asked your not your you know the the new progressive establishment or the new face of the a progressive establishment, which is Kamala Harris, and she right. declined. And then there's the old face of progressives, is is uh, Liz Warren. Right. So Who I just they I all... adore every. Listen, I just want to say on Liz Warren real quick is that everything that she does in terms of Wall Street. I've always liked it. It's like she's almost flawless when it, she cut her in her rhetoric and even action and things and laws that she's tried to um, uh, introduce in relation to Wall Street. She's on point. But, you know, I, I I was really critical of her on our show when I, I felt like she sold out Bernie. And I and I always felt like she should have run like if she was really committed and devoted. And I think if she would have right. um, put her foot in the in the in the water in the beginning of the primary of. 2012 or uh, 2016 i think that she could have clinched it i think she would have had a better chance than even bernie and hillary and she didn't and that always just kind of bothered me and um well, and then let's talk when about it came it. down then let me just say this and then i'll be done and then um and when it came down to the fight between bernie and um hillary she really could have shifted if she'd have endorsed bernie if she'd have endorsed bernie because of where they both stand on wall street and so I, I premised all this by saying I have so much respect for her, for everything in her rhetoric on Wall Street. But she backed Hillary, who, I mean, lives literally up in the anal cavity of Goldman Sachs. That's like where her living room is. It's just way deep up their freaking butt. And so that I always had a problem with. So You mean like Trump's cabinet? <laughs> right. Um, okay, so I get all that. I mean, they they asked her to be there. They, you know, she wasn't able to make it. Whatever, right? Um, and and you know, I I the backlash on Bernie is that he is not good on women's rights. And I'm like, I don't, you know, that was the argument that he wasn't. He didn't come out for women's rights. And I'm like, well, I seem to I seem to remember him coming out for equal pay. He always talks about equal pay for women. And I'm like, that seems pretty, you know. And then I got, well, here's the deal. You know what? And somebody, somebody like flipped out. One of my friends on Facebook flipped out over this. And I was like, wow. And I was like, you know, I mean, just bashing on Bernie and, and, you know, saying how if Bernie hadn't, yeah, how Hillary was blaming her, was, was Hillary was blaming Bernie for saying that she was up Goldman Sachs ass, which gave Trump the foot in the door to say, start calling her corrupt Hillary. So let me just say. So real they're quick, blaming. And then you get, they're blaming Bernie for that. Let me say real quick, and then I'll let you get back in uh, your point, Mike. Is that like it, this? This topic of Bernie at the Women's March thing has really drudged up all all the like Bernie Bros rhetoric and uh, Bernie's against Black Lives Matter bullshit nonsense. That was one of the things that was brought and, up as well. And, Right. And he when has he ever cared about women's rights? And like so this whole thing that Bernie is an anti black, anti like a Women. sexist. You yes. Know, um, yes. And see, this is what I'm going up against. And I'm, I'm like, OK. And I'm being thrown like all this stuff at. Well, he he came out against Planned Parenthood. And I'm like, well, I don't remember him ever coming out against Planned Parenthood. So I start doubting some of them. No, you know. what I remember – let me – all right, we'll check it out. Uh, I remember, and I'm not going to be able to get super specific, but I do remember that this was brought up during the um, uh, uh, primary. And what I remember the issue ultimately being was that, yes, he did vote against a bill that, that made him look like he wasn't supportive of and parenthood. But if I remember correctly, he had um, – he made a statement saying – Yes, but there was all this pork or there was other amendments or things attached to that bill Agreed. that were super counterproductive and that I just not in good conscience and in in um, uh, uh, consistent integrity. I couldn't support that bill. I, Aaron, of course, I, I completely support 
you know, Planned Parenthood. Yeah. I remember that. I do remember that. That's exactly what it was. And he will, they'll, you know how Republicans will write bills and they'll make it look like it's about something, but they'll put in a bunch of bullshit under, you know, and that was one of those things. And he's like, you know, this is not about Planned Parenthood. He's like, I'm fully supportive, but I can't sign this with all this other bullshit on there. So um, basically what I'm getting is I'm now getting attacked by a bunch of, of so-called progressives from the group that I'm a part of, Redlands for Progressive Change. Now, I'm being attacked by these people because I'm trying to support Bernie. And that's all I said. Well, and then I came back with, you know, he's the most popular politician in the country. And he was trying to, and they were trying to bring younger women into the uh, Women's March. Organizers were trying to bring more younger women in. And he's really good with younger people. This is one of the reasons they asked him to be there. So- and I said, and you know, as an old white man, it's not a bad idea because they were they were harsh an old white man, you know, saying if she wants to, you know, be harsh by an old white man, she can walk out her door and get her finger shaking, it, you know, at her because of her lifestyle and and the way she lives and the way she looks. And it's like, look, man, this is one more old white guy like me on your team. Why would you diss him? Why would you, you know? Right. And I got well, fuck, and that's I got hang on I got oh, no. told that's rich bro that's rich man you and like they went off on me and at that point I'm like you know what guys I'm done with you you're supposed to be progressive and this is what I get and Bernie here, Sanders Hillary- is the most progressive and uh, and you can say Hillary was progressive but all her bullshit came because Bernie pushed her left I know Mike hold your point hold your thought let me just say this at no point in your conversation with those people were you like um really criticizing them or attacking Never. them. If anything, you just kind of said, well, okay, I understand where you're coming from, but that's kind of wrong. Actually, I remember Bernie did this. Right. You know? And so I said, it wasn't and I thought- like, it's not like you came at them like, oh, fucking chill with your shit, man. Like Bernie's, the, and you weren't even like, Bernie's the raddest dude ever. And why are you freaking? No, it was like, well, wait a minute. Okay. I understand where you're coming from, but like, that's not yeah. accurate. He that's funny. I remember, this. I remember him doing right. this. I remember him walking around the country supporting Hillary Clinton. I remember him campaigning for, is what I said. I remember her, him campaigning for Hillary Clinton. And I remember him speaking well of Black Lives Matter even after they heckled him. My, my remembrance of that was that they heckled him and he gave them the mic of his podium when they did. He did. He did. He absolutely did. And everyone gave him shit for it's just being interesting. Black Lives Matter when he handed them his microphone. It's you know, just interesting to see how, and look at this, makes it fucking clear, at least to me, that the difference between the establishment and, and, and the rest of us, I mean, that's kind of how it feels like. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm still kind of on board with Bernie. I, I'm not, I haven't given up on him yet. I mean, he's still saying the same fucking thing he said for the last 20 years, man. He's still saying it. He's out and there he's still. still and, I, and I believe yeah. he's doing it for the right fucking reason. I don't believe he's doing it because he's getting kicked back from anybody else. He's doing it because he knows it's the right fucking thing to do. And I believe he's the only one in all of Washington, D.C. that, that is that way. Well, I, don't then, believe, I don't believe any of the other ones. I, I don't believe that, that uh, Warren isn't establishment. She's total establishment. I don't believe any of them are. But it's just – it made it clear to me. And at that point, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to stop right now. Before I get on here and say something that I'm going to regret and have to delete later. Yeah. So I will not, I, will, I don't think I'm going to be going to Redlands for Progressive Change too much anymore. Um, I, I, I got what I think I got, I, I got out of it. I really met some nice people. I, I met Lachey Rodriguez there from Environment California. Check out that interview if you haven't yet. I mean, and that was, that was incredibly awesome. So, and Michael, um, you know, and they, I've made they other connections did, too. And they did organize. Uh, like, dude, they they rallied um, to confront um, fascists. What was the event that you went to with them? Like, in, like in, on the on the on the drop of the dime, Redlands for Progress and Change put that together. And so, right. like, look, they're not horrible. It's just like you know, some, and this is it's important. And I think that, like, yes, it, 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 you, I think you wish it would have ended like uh, on slightly different footing, but. I know that you have like you would probably still encourage people to participate in Redlands for Progressive Change. You know, I, I still think it's a good organization and it's new and they're kind of it's a brand new organization. But I'm not sure. I'm, trying, I'm not I'm not sure. About the I, well, progress, let me say though. this. The point I'm trying to make, Mike, is and this is kind of maybe to our listeners is if you're going to get out and you're going to work with different groups and organize with people. Do your best. Find the Find the ones that work and fit for you the 
best. And ultimately, you're going to find groups that while you have so much in common and their goals are righteous, that ultimately your personalities don't match or maybe you have different things that are important to you than them. And it's OK to sort of separate yourself from a group and find one that works with you better as long as you're out kind of dipping your feet in the water with these groups and trying to do what you did, Mike. And um, but this well, is the, I, I made contacts and that's that's one of the things. That was of course. And, and along the way you do that and you're not, you know, as long as you're not burning bridges along the way which you're not and um no i kind of felt um, like i've kind of felt like they burned this bridge but i'm just i was i'm questioning the the progress well here's the thing i like to call myself progressive and and if you if you guys are calling yourself progressive you need to double check yourself because you are backing establishment establishment ideas and you can say well hillary was the most uh, you know progressive candidate they ever ran bullshit it's bullshit so here's the thing, though. This thing with Bernie at, and, and say this and then maybe we can go ahead and move I on agree. is that like it's really it's just stirred up all this weird shit, man. It's stirred up all this stuff that uh, that we talked about just a minute ago about that were brought up during the um, during the uh, primary season. All this like just totally wrong rhetoric about Bernie Sanders. Like it's all back. And they're all attached to it. And it's for the same reasons. It's so strange to me, Mike. And we talk, we've we talked about this a lot on our show about, OK, everyone got behind Obama in 08. And then they felt like they had to be loyal to him. And they went into full on defend everything he does mode to sort of validate their choice to vote for him. And we do that a lot. And like, um, you know, we were careful. We struggled with that in the beginning in supporting Bernie. We didn't want to be backers and followers of Bernie. You know, because we wanted to be open to if he does things that we're critical of to be critical. So it's like people went into such support. I'm with her. What a ridiculous campaign slogan. And to me, offensive campaign slogan. I am not with any politician. They have to fucking be with me, man. And that's a problem right on its face. That they said, I'm with her. She's just a person and she's a politician. And they can't let go of this intense need to defend her. And guess what? The far right is totally exploiting that reality. And all they have to do is continue to talk shit on Hillary. And so many progressives and liberals flip their shit and can't handle it and are are still defending Hillary Clinton, who guess what? Her political career is over, bro. I mean, she's essentially retired. She's going to write books and do speaking circuits for the rest of her life and be a consultant and shit. Dude, I'm Why is you, anyone defending a, a non-player in the political spectrum? They think she's they're going to run her again. They think she's, they're gonna, they might run her again, although they are talking about Biden. If they run Hillary Clinton, then the Democratic Party is just destroyed. I don't, and I don't, it's underst- like, it's I don't like, understand, it's, bro. You know what, dude? I'm going to say this, bro. I'm going to liken – if you're out there defending Hillary Clinton at this point, I, I, all of her political stances aside, I'm not criticizing these people because of their reason – because of uh, Hillary Clinton's political point, whatever – wherever you fall on that left, right, what, whatever. Uh, that aside, your fervor and your support of her at this point is very much akin to Trump's loyal base. It, it is so much Ooh, akin to it burned. because you are blindly supporting a woman or a politician. Doesn't matter what her gender is, whatever. A politician who is just there's no way she's going to run again. I think the only people who would think that is this core base of hers. I don't think anybody in DNC establishment circles is considering Hillary Clinton for sixteen. Uh, like ch- I mean, for, next. for 18 you know no it's 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 kamala it's cory booker it's it's oh you know, wait it's they're gonna kind of, they're gonna run uh, uh, michelle obama oh god so anyway so it's just let hillary go she's not there for please, you please let, please oh. let her go please let her go please please let her go she lost fucking let her go i don't care who you blame blame bernie all you want fucking let it go okay we're done loyalty to her is causing you to have conflict with your fellow leftists and progressive that's all it's doing let's and move she's never on. gonna you so trump and oh my god dude he's oh just 100 percent lead by executive order president such a fucking because dictator. he can't get anything through 
He's got no legislation through. He has to. That's the only way. Lead fucking. He's not. He's anyway. Okay. Anyway. He's got more executive orders than um, in his first, you know, eight months or whatever than any president. He's just because, like you said, he just hasn't passed shit. So he couldn't, you know, the nine hundred and seventy three thousand times that the that the Republicans have tried to repeal and replace Obamacare has failed. So he's just going to screw millions of people out of health care through the sign of his wonderful, you know, tremendous pen. Right. He's going to eliminate the subsidies to the insurance companies so that they actually make money. So if the insurance companies that have to insure these people with pre-existing conditions and these kids that are now on their parents' insurance a little bit longer, now that they have to insure these people, they're going to lose money. And so in order for them to not lose money and to keep the premiums at a decent rate for us poor people to buy them, they, um, they get these subsidies from the government. And the subsidies come from dun, 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 taxing the rich. It's like a stupid little percentage of a tax. I think it went from 13 to 15 percent, so it's like two percent. But basically, it pays for all those subsidies. Now, um, one of the they tried to do this before. Well, they've done it before. They've already they've already done this once. They did it with the risk corridors, which is basically the same fucking thing. Uh, Marco Rubio stuck into one of those bills that we were talking about, how Bernie Sanders does, right? That he doesn't vote for. Well, it was some like a budget bill or something, and they stuck this in there to pull these. Um, these risk corridors out so that the insurance companies now would get paid less money. So now they, that's why they start pulling out. So they're trying to sabotage the, um, um, the affordable care act. Um, and, and I saw an article, dude, I saw an article today that was saying, um, that, that, uh, that, that could be an impeachable offense. In fact, I think it was Robert Reich, um, said that that could be an impeachable offense. I mean, he is sworn to, um, take care of the uh, the the welfare the, wealth, the welfare uh, of the welfare of the American people, and by eliminating health insurance for a couple hundred million people, is not really taking care of the welfare of the American people. So, and, yeah, and, you know, this rhetoric is Trump's rhetoric is you know um, that we'll just let Obamacare implode. No, but no, it's, we're, that's it's not, not going to implode. That's not accurate because what you're doing is you're sabotaging it like you said earlier mike is this is a sabotage of obamacare that then he walks away from and goes oh look at obamacare is imploding which is you know right-wing politics 101 this disaster politics thing this you know we'll just totally defund something right. make sure that it just you know crumbles and fucks up on itself and we'll go see it doesn't see, work it, see it doesn't work so now we have to do this horribly we oppressive republic it. Now we have to privatize right. it. Right, 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 right. You know, so – and and again, it's just – it's across the board with um, with the Trump administration agenda. It is that same old age-old um, far right-wing, ultimately libertarian, um, free market at all costs – uh, ideology. And, you know, let's look at like, OK, Marino, the guy that um, that Trump was going to um, that was putting up as the proposed drugs are. Right. Uh, right. This, and, this this new ass hat he's got now. Right. Which apparently is not going to be the drugs are now. But why? What came out about him and the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he took to facilitate passing a bill that made it possible for the pharmaceutical companies to ease restrictions on them so that they could just flood the American market with uh, opioids, which directly led to a massive, massive pharmaceutical opioid epidemic in the United States. And this guy, Marino, (laughs) the president of the United States, wanted to head his freaking drug policy, was directly profited from that process and facilitated its implementation. So it's, it's you know, Mike, it's, yeah, but it's, it's not surprising. Come on. We got no, Steve not. Mnuchin as the treasury secretary. We got the head of, of Exxon as secretary of state. Every single uh, person that Trump has appointed to head a department has a long history of trying to destroy the department that they're now a part of. It, it's the total ban in legacy of, um, you know, deconstruction, dystopian, you know, uh, Armageddon-esque, you know, 
you know, when people are completely um, backed into a corner and, and society is crumbled and there's devastation everywhere, they'll lean heavily on a strong man to follow. Well, that's politics, bro. That's that's disaster politics. Right. It's and and if there's not a disaster, then we create one, like nine eleven. And then we can erode. We can that way. We have the right now to take away human rights. Why y'all, why y'all ain't looking? Or at least take you know however you fall on nine eleven. I mean, inside job or not inside job. I mean, the reaction to it was obviously we. It was massively exploited. Right? The, the, oh, absolutely. Come on. They, the final lap. It's, yeah. it's called the Patriot Act, bro. Right, right. And the NSA. And um, so much of our current foreign intervention, which resulted in further acts of terrorism, which ultimately led to the formation of ISIS. I thought Obama made ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was just as much. I think Obama, Obama is and just Hillary. culpable and Hillary and Bush. They're all culpable in it's not like any one of those people went out and directly like put ISIS together. But, you know, Bush's um, debasification order during the first initial attack in Iraq, um, coupled with um, his, com- talk his, about. his complete dismantling of the military in Iraq led to, again, disaster capitalism because then it let all these private companies come in and profit off it, which ultimately created the perfect conditions for the rise of isis let's talk so about like, isis let's talk about isis in iraq for a minute real quick okay bro because just this week um the coalition forces took mosul uh, back from iran back from iraq uh back from isis i guess they were holed up in in, in the last in the hospital there and there was about I, from what i heard today there was four of them and i actually saw i actually saw it dude they had vice had a dude on the ground there last week and they were showing this guy running around with these other dudes, like, shooting at ISIS. And these guys were talking about, like, the people in Mosul, when, when the coalition forces came in and liberated these people out of Mosul, they were kissing them. They were kissing the ground. They were thanking them. They were coming up to them. And they would the words were translated, thank you, praise be to Allah, thank you, God, for getting us out of there. They talked about the beheadings in the streets. This little 12-year-old kid saw people get beheaded in the street. For I mean, these the, the ISIS are apparently, according to these people, horrible horrific hor- just doing horrendous things to to these people in 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 Mosul so i mean you can blame all that stuff on the rise of iraq and they're all pissed off because we you know our government is occupying their lands and has probably killed some of their family members and it's it's revengeful but the bullshit that they're doing to the their own fucking people and i and in what i mean uh, these people are animals so i don't even know if if that's an accurate statement that you know all that shit caused ISIS. It may have started, but what it's at now, dude, seems like it's just fucking horrendous. Well, so. first of all, I just I just want to say that I, I don't agree that they're animals. They are human beings. And, okay, um, I, I agree. But, I take that back, and I, I, I stand corrected. I know, and, and, I, and I know they that. They act like animals. How's that? Right. That's much better. And I, and I know where you stand on I know you, that was just a slip, bro. But um, the thing is, it's, it's theocracy. It's what um, authoritarian yeah. theocra- uh, theocracies do. Same thing with all of these, um, um, you know, far right wing Christo fascist people that we're we're going to get back into later. And um, you know, but and we kind of went off on a, 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 a tangent about ISIS there. Um, but you know that, that that is what it's going to do. And it's not that it's Islam's fault per se. That you know, it's not. Because any religion that you take too fundamentally serious and that, that's coupled with this need to go out and win people over to it, which Christianity is fraught with that same kind of um, mandate, it leads yeah. to things like ISIS. You know, and it's not – again, it's just not singular to any one religion. You know, it's an authoritarian, theocratic I completely uh, agree. obsession. And, and, um, and we're going to get into how it manifests in America – uh, out of your Bible Belters a little bit later in the show. But, so, um, um, do you want to... Let's get into... Yeah, well, let's move on, and let's... let's talk God, about man. some fire? Yeah, California. Fire. Santa Rosa. Fire! Oh, my it's God, like, dude. Aunt Santa Rosa, dude. like, doesn't exist. It's like it doesn't exist oh anymore, Oh, my God, dude. I couldn't... The pictures, bro, I was looking at... I've seen pictures all week long. 
just, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it just it devastated the entire, it's gone. It's just fucking gone. It's like it looks worse than, like you look at um, devastations like from Hiroshima and stuff, and there's, there were buildings standing <laughs> afterwards. It's like, it's just flattened. You see some like leftover hubs of cars and stuff, but I mean, there's just. Everything is just horrible. And then, you know, to, just Anaheim Hills. to their foundations. Canyon Fire 2. So there was a fire a couple weeks ago. I put a picture of it on my Instagram. It's called Canyon Fire. And it was over um, in Anaheim Hills in Corona, right off 241, which is, you know, the um, toll road that I take to go to the beach. And um, last time I went, in fact, coming home, you could just see how, I mean, it burned right down to the 91 freeway. And, I, you know, my thought was somebody flicked a fucking cigarette out there and lit that shit on fire. And, it, you know, it happened to be Santa Ana condition and the wind blew the fucking fire up the hill and started this whole thing on fire. Now, they didn't lose a whole lot of, uh, of houses. I think there were some outbuildings and maybe one or two houses burned on the first time. Um, but it burned for a week or so. They finally got the thing out. And then it started up again last week, man. And it's, it's, it was just out of control. I, I, they closed the 241 down. This, the, it was so hot that um, signs had melted. They had to replace the signs where they could open up the road again. And I just want to clarify, Mike, you, that was just your thought that it was a cigarette thing. Do we know that? Do, no, do we have, that's to my do thought. Do know how it started yet? Sure, I, sure. I don't know. I have not heard. That was my thought. But like I said, bro, it was right sure. to the 91 freeway. And, you know. Right. Which is, and that's happened so many times in Southern California. And then especially in all the, the five-year drought. And I, I heard it came out this – this uh, I heard a, somebody talking on the news this week, Mike, that um, basically all the um, – moisture and and rain season and stuff that kind of got caught up from after the drought like we had california had good rains this year apparently you had it uh, a great winter whatever, yes. and lots of water but it's like gone and like like that's it's been well, exhausted is my well, understanding it, and sort of we're sort of back to <laughs> um it, it didn't help all we had we had a very good rainy season last year but i mean come on dude one one year of decent rains of even more than enough rain for a season. Oh, yeah, we had – what? We had a uh, – you know what I mean? We had more rain than, right. than normal. So uh, uh, a higher than normal amount of rain is not going to make up for five years of not having enough rain, basically. And the fact uh, – But what it did do – what it did do is it made all the vegetation grow. So, uh, you know, springtime, everything was nice and green. Everything got all nice and, and, and grew real pretty. And then, you know, summer came and it's been, come on, bro, we've, been, we've talked about it. It's been 100 degrees. It's, yeah. it's, it's 90 today, October 18th, and it's 90 in Southern California right now with Santa Ana's. Santa Ana's was supposed to be cooling off. And they, well, and they talked about, too, because of the five-year drought, a lot of the forest died. From um, the black, forest, uh, well, the, well, that the, yes, and the bark beetle came in and ate, you know, killed a bunch of trees. So that that doesn't help. Which I probably is probably one of the things you're dealing with, with up in Santa Rosa. I know that that's happened here in Big Bear. Now we haven't had a fire in Big Bear this year, and what's been burning hasn't been forest. It's all been you know foothills and grassland. But you know, homes burned, and like I said, they, you know, the freeway burned, and and it was just we had a fire just over Cajon Pass not that long ago that burned cars on freaking 15 dude remember yeah 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 i remember that and i also want to say uh, real quick um if people want to go on to our facebook page uh, a pinned post on our facebook page is a, a, a link that you can um go to to donate it's a um uh, it was a north bay um iww um fellow workers up there set it up uh, to raise funds to help with the disaster relief in um all these it's not just santa rosa there's like just numerous communities in um northern california that are just beyond devastated man i mean on the heels of but anyway so i just please go on to our page it's the pinned post it's right at the top of our of our page on facebook and you can click on it and um do what you can to donate if you can and uh, but michael it's on the heels of all these hurricanes right and, uh, you know, yes. Florida and Houston and, you know, um, dude, well, there's a, what was the, um, Venezuela in a massive fire, right? Yes. Yes. Venezuela is on freaking fire too. So it's not just California that's on fire, but Venezuela is also on fire. And then, um, 
Talk to me about uh, who's fighting these fires, Michael. So um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Aaron. You might be. Um, we have the um, – what is it? CDF, California Department of Fire or something? Forestry, California Department of Forestry. Um, right next to um, California Institution for Men in Chino. Um, and apparently they – normally use model prisoners um to fight fires so um and they pay them a dollar an hour so actually right now on our on the on the front lines the front lines the front lines as i repeat myself um we have women firefighters that are inmates we have women fighting the fire that are actually inmates getting paid a dollar an hour okay I don't give a fuck what that that's just slavery. You might as well just not pay me. It anything. is slavery. Well, that's of course that's it is just slavery. goddamn slavery. Right. And here's the thing too, bro, is um who was this officer that came out this week talking about like um basically how upset he is that um these people who are model inmates that we have to let them go because they do all the good stuff. They make all the stuff for us and they fight the fires for us. And so like he was bemoaning um his having to let model in inmates out of jail because they do all the work it's so gross man that they can make these women go out and risk their fucking lives they die women will die out there bro it's happened for a dollar a day while we go out and thank firemen every day which you should i i'm Deep, immense respect for the fire department. We talk a lot about how much uh, I don't like cops on our show, but get it straight. I have a shit ton of respect for, like, EMTs and firefighters and legit first responders who devote their life to helping others straight up. Um, But we don't – you know, where's the love and respect and the the, uh, hero worship for these prisoners, man? Nobody knows about them. Because there's a shit ton more of them out there than firefighters. I mean, how many people are really aware that we've got inmates fighting fires out there, getting paid a dollar an hour and, and, and basic slavery? And then what they do at the end of the day is go back to a fucking six by nine toilet. Well, I don't know about that. No one thinks. Uh, from my them. understanding, they get a little bit better because they're the model inmates, so they don't go. I don't. Well, you know, most of them, most of them, um, stay in prison camps. They're they're like um, minimum security camps when you, they're working camps and stuff. So they're probably like in bunkhouse settings. It's actually probably what they're staying in. Yes, that's exactly what this article said. Was that they they stay yeah. in camps. And then when they get no. out, they're fe- they're felons. Do you think they can fucking go out and become firefighters? They're gonna no, have a, they've a gotta hell of check the box. Just getting, they're gonna have a hell of a time just getting a job because yeah, they gotta check the fucking box, man. Don't we have a video at the end of the show we're gonna talk about? Uh, we talk about that. It relates to this. Yeah, we do. We have a really good video for the end of the show that gets into that. So I. Uh... Anyway, check it out, man. I put the article on our Facebook page. Um, the the lady that wrote the article was on um, Democracy Now! today, and uh, I found it fascinating. I thought you would enjoy it, and I thought our listeners and followers would enjoy it as well. So check that out. And so, you know, yeah. Um, it, look, I, I wanted to tie it in. We talked a little bit about how, you know, uh, or I mentioned, you know, all of these fires and stuff is on the heels of the hurricanes and this massive just – Beyond, we use the word devastation so much now; it's ridiculous. But, um, but you know, there was a, a a huge hurricane in Ireland this week as well. Um, not maybe on the scale of what happened in Houston and stuff, but I mean, this is an imbalance. I actually you know, did because I thought, my my first thought was waves because I know there's waves in Ireland, and I was like, did they say Ireland? There's a hurricane in Ireland. I'm like, well, yeah, they got coast. So, but just it's just you know. The Pope came out and, you know, yeah, even, talk- the, even the freaking Pope, man, talk about yeah, yeah, Judeo Christian values. But he's, you know, upset with Trump's pulling out of the Paris Peace Accords. And because it's so freaking obvious that our total global weather patterns are all screwed up. And I 
What, that's, what, um, what, what? You're telling me? You're telling the pool guy that lives outside every day that the weather pattern screwed up? It, I mean, come on, dude. I've been doing pools for 30 years. You cannot. None of the guys I talk to at the warehouse, and I don't know what political affiliation they are, but if I say, hey, if it wasn't like this 30 years ago when I started, fuck no, man. Yeah, because you live, you live and Nobody. die by the new weather patterns, dude. You, right. You have to, Nobody I talk to. And all that kind of stuff. And, dude, yeah. nobody I talk to will, will disagree that the climate isn't changing. Nobody. Anyway. So let's talk about Puerto Rico. Whoa. Fuck, man. They still don't have electricity. They still don't have fucking electricity. Um... Uh, apparently, they FEMA's throwing away the food. They're not even found. FEMA can't be found. I did hear they had a party at one of the biggest hotels there. No, that's um, good. Uh, yeah, and we're dancing and, and doing this the Macarena. This has mo- been a really Macarena. fun disaster. This has been such a fun disaster. You know what I mean? Trump, says they, can't, Trump says they can't hang out any longer, they, that they've done such a good job, that everything's done, they, they're boning out. But, you know, they said they were having issues, you know, the government said they were having issues getting to this FEMA camp or whatever. And, and, and these volunteers went and were able to find the FEMA camp, no problem, and found a dumpster full of pallets of unused water and food that were supposed to be distributed. Yeah, straight up. And check this out. There's another video that we posted a while, like probably about a week, a half ago or two weeks ago on our Facebook channel, our page. And, um, it was a bunch of these veteran volunteers who went out to um, to help, and um, they had seen like um, manifests where um, things were checked as like um, received and then delivered out into the field. And these guys who were the people who were supposedly received would have received them had never received it. So the manifests were a lie. And you know, and these are the, this is the, the the manifest. This is the paperwork that Trump is basing his "We're doing so great with Puerto Rico" on. He and tossed paper towels a couple weeks ago. Aren't they good? Right. And then, so there it is, Mike. The article that you cited, what you said about finding these dumpsters of pallets of food and stuff, just bolsters that this stuff didn't get distributed. There's just no infrastructure to deal with this. And the governor Dude, that we've been no hearing idea. about is just another. We talk about living up in the butt. I, that's my take on him is he's just living up in Trump's butt and loving being governor guy. Well, you know, but, Trump said he was going to get rid of the, the debt, and, and then they walked that back. Well, no, I can't really do that. Um, and and I, this does definitely have something to do with money and Wall Street money because they ain't doing shit over there. They have cholera, let me clarify, they have that. Let me clarify that before you go on. Let me clarify that real quick before you go on, Mike. So what he's talking about eliminating the debt is that prior to this um, hur- hurricane devastation in Puerto Rico, it, it was already like $95 billion in debt, I think. if something It was like really hurting. It was close to a trillion, yeah. Right. And so that's on, you know, prior to this massive amount of um, devastation owned. now. And so it's like not only can, so how do you even begin to deal with this new stuff if there's already this ninety five billion dollar debt that you're looking at? And that's when Trump made his statement about, you know, you're really messing with our economy, like because, you know, budget. with their hurricane his that budget. they made. Right. His budget. And um, right. because it's going to cost a trillion dollars to rebuild Basically, and they're already a trillion dollars in debt to private lenders. Right. And guess what? It's fucking we're not bullshit. It. This is colonization to the core. And we won't spend it. We're not going to spend that trillion dollars to, to, yeah, you know the. No, because they're they're. What were you saying about the mayors to me earlier off off air? Yeah. Mike, we um. Well, the um. Yeah, the governor's pretty much up Trump's ass. They, they can't find him. He he's just running around with his head up his ass, not knowing what's going on. I guess. And the mayor of um. Uh, San Juan has kind of become basically the, the spokesperson for the country. And all the other mayors of all the other cities in, in Puerto Rico have come to her, and she's kind of like the voice for, all you know, basically the country. And she's like, you know, this is just fucking political bullshit. We're dying over here. Get off your fucking ass and take care of us. This is flat-out colonial bullshit. We fucking colonize these people, and now we're not going to take care of them. Nope, they have we're no not. fucking this. They, they this one. Uh, you know, I saw this interview. It was on Democracy Now today. It was a good show. They even had you should watch it. <laughs> they even had um, Chicano Batman on this afternoon. This uh, on the, on, before the last uh, segment it was really good. Um, 
but they were saying there's this lady like living up in in um in the mountains and she's using a car battery to like boil water and make food and shit a fucking car battery they have no electricity the cholera there's dead animals in the streets dude that have drowned and they're starting to rot and it's polluting the water these people don't have fucking water there's no running water they're washing their shit in the fucking rivers they're taking water from Superfund sites that have been, like, um, chemically um, uh, uh, deadened. There's so much chemicals in these fucking sites that nothing can grow there, and they're just deadened. And, and they're taking water off of these sites and, and, and drinking it and wondering why they have stomach aches and shit. Dude, it's fucking horrible. Waterborne disease is horrible. So basically, listen, zero, um, less than zero is going to be done to help Puerto Rico. Trump got... Got his um, uh, minute in the news cycle, and um, he feels like he did tremendous, wonderful things because um, he signed something that FEMA gave him that sent food. So he thinks it's done. He doesn't know, probably doesn't even know that the thing he signed became pallets of food in a dumpster and didn't do shit to help anybody. So um, that's just going <laughs> to it, it just it it shows how little this man cares about humanity. And let's talk about. Um, these soldiers, these uh, the this these four soldiers from like Niger um, and Trump's insanely ridiculous statements and handling of this situation. Um, like, where do I even start, bro? I mean, okay, so he talks to. Um, well, start with happened. These what the the four soldiers were ambushed apparently, right, and killed, and. And that was this was fucking weeks ago. This was weeks yeah. ago, three weeks ago or some shit, right? And Which Trump, we wouldn't have known about at all. Had, and let, but because um, Trump hadn't said shit. Well, now no, I've heard about it. I've heard about it for at least for the last couple of weeks. Well, I, I've right, seen, because I've of seen some st- reporter you know, that because of a reporter that brought it out. It wasn't well, like no, the bro. No, I made a statement. No, no, that's no. Hang on, let me finish. Um, I've seen Rumble on, on Twitter. And I've seen Rumble where – how come this happened? He's bitch, used to bitch at Obama. How come he hasn't come out and said this? Finally, finally yesterday, this reporter came out and said, dude, what the fuck? How come you haven't said anything? And he's like, what do you mean? Uh, the other president's never said anything. I say things when I think I need to say something, and I, I'll say something. I, uh- Always call. I've called every he, he single fucking, one of these parents, and, and it's, I'm it's great, f- and I do awesome stuff. And every other president that's black uh, has never done that. Oh, They've no, never he went farther, bro. And- he went back. He said Bush, Clinton. Oh, he went back. They never called. What the fuck? I know an Obama administration person came out and said, I think, oh, exactly that. That's fucking fuck? bullshit. Like, yeah, like, what the – yeah. Yeah, fucking basically, nonsense, yes. I think is what he said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. he doubled down on it again, of course, because that's what he does. He fucking doubles down on his lies. So he gets called on it. He gets totally, it's, you know. Uh, and then he talks to the the pregnant wife. Right. Okay. So no way. Hang on. Hang on. First, the body comes back yesterday. Okay. Right. So the body comes back. Right. Where's Trump? Guess. Golfing. Fucking golfing. I, maybe it wasn't today. It came back. Maybe it was a couple of days ago. But it was like so. Like he was basically when that plane landed, he was golfing, and uh, there's pictures on the internet of of his wife and daughter draped over the casket, and she's bawling, you know, crying as the as the casket comes in, right? So apparently, and I want to say before you move on, um, dude. However, again, you know how much we've already gone off about how much we dislike Hillary Clinton in today's show. But check it out: the when bodies came back from Benghazi, my understanding is both Obama. And, and Hillary, Hillary were, were on the tarmac when those bodies came back. So you're, what was it, four, in, nine? How many ing- congressional inquiries into Benghazi? Like, at least she was there. I think it was nine, bro. And I yeah. think it was 1.5 oh. mil apiece. I think it ended up being over $13 million in taxpayer money to investigate that bullshit to come up with nothing. To basically put Trump in office. And Trump golfed. Trump golfed. And when... he was golfing, so... So right. motherfucker says, you know, so he gets hit up, so he decides to give him a little call today. So do you want to know what he says? Oh my God. Apparently, he says, well, you know, he knew the job was dangerous when he signed up for it. <laughs> so, so, super chicken to Fred, 
you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. Yeah. And to it's like, pregnant, wow. To the pregnant, grieving widow. Now, now, he's denied this. He's tweeted out. He's denied it. You know, so the, there, was a, there was a Democratic con- Congress lady, a congresswoman, congressperson there. <laughs> I'll get it right eventually. Um, and heard right. it. And she was like, you know, tweeted about it or something. And, right. Right. And it was like, he, this, he, I can't believe he fucking said that. And he came out and said, no, she's making it up. She, I, you know, it's bullshit. I, I didn't ever said that and went on and on about how he didn't say that. And then there was like a military guy there. I think like a colonel or something. He was like, mm, yeah, he, he said it flat out. So this fucking, okay, 25th Amendment, man. I mean, I know it's not going to fucking happen, but he is incompetent. He's got narcissistic behavior disorder. He has no empathy. The man cannot show any empathy. He threw fucking paper towels at disaster victims. He told them to have a good time. Mm -hmm. And he still, he still comes away from all of this. Niger, Niger, um, Puerto Rico. He believes he was amazing. He does. He, believes he it. absolutely He's does. He's seriously because everybody not okay him, in his brain, man. He's not, bro. Yeah. He's got people around him that have to tell him that. And see, this whole thing, yeah. bro, it just, oh, God, every fucking box in the fascism checklist is checked off. Every single fucking one of them. And this is just one more. He's insane. He has psychological problems. They had a convention. I don't know what convention. There was a gathering of psychologists and doctors this weekend that, like, marched, uh, you know, uh, like, dude, 25th Amendment. He's fucking crazy. We're doctors. We're scientists. We're psychologists. He's fucking crazy. Get him out of office. Yeah. And 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 what was it? The um, Oh, my gosh. What is it called? The conference that Trump spoke at this week, which is like. Put on it's this annual conference of like super far right wing nationalist nutbag. God, what was he spoke at today? Uh, I'm not gonna be able to think of it, but <laughs> Chicano yeah. Batman conference. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's stuck in my head. No, it's okay. Uh, I, I feel like an idiot for having brought it up because now that no, I no, it's okay. Oh. No, I, I can't remember uh, either. But if there, there's stuff on our on our Facebook channel about it too. In the that in the lead up to it where it was, this was a very significant moment that he spoke at this conference because it is a, um, solidified historically white nationalist group that has the hint and the hint, the tinge of establishment, um, um, validation. You mean like they've, they've like, I'm I'm losing my words today. Well, it's essentially kind of like, a. The, the really established, long-standing version of what Breitbart has become, which is, oh, we're, gonna, we're just this. You're, right, 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 right. They've normalized this right-wing hate group. So while our president is talking to white nationalists in a conference, um, a, a massive group of psychologists and doctors and, and, and uh, neurologicals peoples were in the street going, this dude's a whack job and we need to get rid of him. Can I, can I point out one thing, other, one other thing, bro? Just, just, and I noticed, happened to notice. All right, only one though. The skin color of the, um, of the family that we're discussing, that Trump said that to. They're a black family. Well, there it is. That's everything. That a, I mean, right? I mean, if it was a if it was a white soldier, that he probably would have told this woman, "He is such a hero. He's in heaven for." I mean, he probably would, he would have just I don't fucking love know. and praise on this woman. I think he would. have. No, of course we don't know, but it sure I didn't well, know, on. bro. That I, well, listen, I I was not aware until you said that that. Um, oh yeah, I, I, I want to say, I, I and, say his name is Johnson. I maybe I'm not sure, I, I, but I mean. Yeah, no, but that definitely. explains his total disconnection and lack of empathy or caring for the loss of this pregnant widow. All she did was lose a black man. <laughs> you know, it's not like it was a, a full person, just a, someone who Jesus. should be a slave. Right. I mean, he should should have been a slave. Why was he not in prison? I mean, that's 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 our president. That's our president, man. He just doesn't give a shit because of the color of 
skin tone, that this man gave his life for our country. <laughs> but, you know. It's fucking disgusting, man. I mean, come on. What I was going to say is, like, I mean, it, it's clear how he feels. Who did he, who does he tweet about? Who did he call a fucking son of a bitch? Oh, Colin Kaepernick. Gee, what color was him? What color is he? Um, he, um, he tweeted about Steph Curry not showing up. Gee, this is what color is Steph Curry? He tweeted about Jamel Hill getting suspended from ESPN, and I'm fucking still pissed off about that. It's bullshit. Well, gee, what color is Jamel Hill? It's fucking bullshit. You racist motherfucker. Jamel Hill got fired, or not fired, suspended for tweeting that he's a racist motherfucker. She flat out said he's a white supremacist and a racist, and they suspended her for that. We have a Nazi tweeter in chief with executive orders. That's he's in charge of our country. It's a dictator. You know, um, the president of Iran called him a dictator. You know? Wow. Um, It takes one to know one. We were going to mention Iran. Why don't we go ahead and do that? And then oh, um, let's talk a little bit about it. More fucking Trump in, in, incapability of doing anything constructive. So he decides he's going to he, – he really does not like this Iran deal. I don't think he fucking understands it, and it's so goddamn basic. You know, I, I, Once I understood it, it was like, oh, pff, this is nothing. This is just child's play. Even I can negotiate this one. I mean – you know, they were starving. We had cut them off with sanctions so bad they were starving. They have no problem not enriching uranium for for weapons. Please don't put the sanctions back on us. We will. They're in total compliance. Kelly, General Kelly, came out and said, "Yeah, they're in total compliance. We're in total compliance." What does he do? He decertifies it. I don't think they're in total compliance. I'm going to decertify it. So what that does is that kicks it back to Congress. And and the Republicans are going, well, Congress never had a say in, to start with, and they should be able to say whether we can put sanctions on things or not. And, you know, Congress was kind of, kind of pissed off. And, it, you know, they yeah, that's, what they were, this. that's what they were crying about at the time when this deal was being well, they're formulated. Still fucking they were like, about Obama, it. Obama dictator negotiating deals in his State Department, you know, co dictator negotiating deals. Like, well, that's what the State Department does. It negotiates. <laughs> in- that's and basically, and- yeah, it's functions. You know? and- negotiate right but that was their that was their talking point you know their canard talking point at the time and which started this whole um ongoing rhetoric about how the iran deal was bad is it's this horrible evil thing that was the genesis of it was well congress doesn't have a say in what you know hillary dictator is doing like well <laughs> All right, so now here you are, and now it's in Congress's lap, and what are you going to do with it except bitch about how stupid it is and how horrible it is? I, I, what, what's your take on what Congress is going to do, Mike? Uh, sit on it and do nothing because I think Congress fucking knows that Iran is in compliance and that they're not enriching uranium to make weapons, that they're using uranium to do you know medical and so forth, whatever the fuck you use uranium for. Um, I, I I think everything's working. It's do the the, the deal is doing what it's doing. I'm I'm hoping. My thought is I'm hoping it just dies right there. I think Congress is more. I I think Congress is more concerned about this fucking tax bill that's out there that they're sure, trying sure. to get pushed. They know that 2018 is coming up, and if they don't produce the tax break for their rich donors, there's a good possibility they're going to lose their fucking cushy jobs. So they, if they don't have anything to come back with, you know, in 2018 and go, well, look, we got, ta- you know, what happened to Obamacare? What happened to this? What happened to tax reform? Where's my fucking tax cuts? And and everybody that's looked at this, bro, I mean, it's nearly bipartisan, basically, I think, except for the base that's saying this is a fucking tax cut for the rich. It's just right. blatant, blatant tax cut for the rich. It's a redistribution of wealth to the top. In about ten years or something, it just it, you know. And just let me throw this out there. And I mean, and this is really simple. And I think me and you, I this has made me understand it because I always got the um, earned income credit. Did you you ever get the earned income credit? One year. Oh, no, see, we I, got it. A, we got it a couple years uh, when the kids were little. Right. We 
because that's what it's for, man. It's you get about a thousand dollars, and I, I think if you have three kids and you make twenty five thousand dollars a year or something like that, or less. Than no, and 30, it was amazing, dude. It pretty much like yeah, you know, it's made a couple Christmas. Grand that, you know, we went, we spent every last dollar of it when we got it, and it went to like. What, I'm sorry. What did you What did you do with that money? What did you spent do? Every the, dollar, like on you Christmas, spent every and that fucking kind of dollar of that money. You didn't invest it yeah. or put it in an offshore account in Panama. Hell no, hell no. Just, <laughs> okay, I so wish. that's 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 just part of my point. That's just part of the point. Understand that when you give money and tax cuts to middle income and low income people, guess what they fucking do with that money? They spend it. When you give tax cuts to rich people, you know what they do? They put it in fucking offshore accounts in in Panama. So, what they're gonna do is what this what this bill does. It it eliminates. See, and I got it too, bro. Because I could, you know, work my my income down enough, and then I would I could tack that on there, and that would kick me down, and you know, a thousand dollars or so, and I would do the same dang thing. I'd get caught up on bills. I would do this. We'd do something with the kids. We'd remodel a bedroom. Something stupid like that. You know what I mean? Right. They're eliminating that. So, basically, if you eliminate a tax cut, that's seen as raising taxes. So you've eliminated a tax cut for low income people. The NC and that's what it is. It's low income. If you make over fifty thousand a year as a family with three people, you don't get it. So it works its way out. Follow me? As you if if you start, if you earn good and you make more money and your kids get older and you're doing good and now you're over fifty grand and you still got the three kids, you don't get it. It works its way out. It's for low-income people. It's to help them out because you know what they fucking do? They spend that money, which stimulates the economy. They put it right right. back into that shit. It's not the fucking rich people that stimulate the economy. It's the it's the working class that does it. This eliminates that. It's a it's a fucking it's a tax increase on low and middle-income people. It's a tax break for the rich, just by eliminating that earned income credit right there. So. So, yeah, right. And so here's the thing that I will say to, to sort of wrap up this um, is, that, like I said, there's I've said this before on our show that there's, sign up, there's always kind of two things at play with um, – actually, let's scratch it. Let me, let me frame it like this. Um, the whole Iran thing is this massive dog and pony show, shit show distraction. It's like – this is this great thing that we can push out as talking points and we can keep the media all abuzz with it. And, you know, I, Trump is going to overturn the Iran deal. What he did is he kicked it to Congress where it will probably die and be forgotten about because the next crazy ass thing he does tomorrow will help us forget that the Iran deal was even an issue ever. And now he's not accountable for it anymore. He got, um, you know, he was able to run on fuck the Iran deal. And so now he's, you know, appeased his base by, you know, uh, making all these statements. But meanwhile, while all this is going on, they're, what they're really pushing is this massive tax break that Mike had just described. Yep, that's exactly it. So it's uh, another recurring theme in our show is don't be baffled by the bullshit. Uh, it's so hard because there's so much bullshit. And some of it... It's kind of baffling, and you just go, wow, <laughs> that's really baffling, you know? <laughs> How like when you're but, driving down the freeway and you see a car upside down, you go, wow, fuck, check that shit out, you know? And it's like, I'd love, I would love to see the Trump administration implode like he's hoping Obamacare will. Right. And, and it looks like we're headed there. Scott Pruitt is still in the EPA, by the way. Just <laughs> I had to check that one out. But yeah. I, I, it was the dude from Health and Human Services that, that – Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, I, I, and so when I hear like this just crazy ass shit that he does, it's almost like clickbait. You know, you just want to go, right. please implode, right. please implode. Right? right. So but I, I, it's so hard to say. It really looks like it's going that way. It looks like Republicans are starting to get fed up. It's only been, what, 10 fucking months. Y'all you know, finally start now to get fed up with this bullshit. Um, you know how we were talking about um, what's that dude, that Congress dude from last from last week that called him out that he was fighting with? I can't Corker? remember. Corker, Bob Corker. Yes, a good job, Aaron. Um, <laughs> um, I heard that you know he. We talked about how you know he's always voted with him. 
Right. He's he's he voted to gut Obamacare. He's he's one of those fucking Republicans. He's he's not one of like toe the line. Fat. He's one of those dude. But he also knows how to play the fucking game. Apparently, he's right. been on Survivor once or twice. I'm kidding. That's a joke. Uh, but he knows <laughs> he knows how to play the game, and he knows in order to get Trump's attention, you fucking call him out on Twitter. And that's exactly what Corker did is he called him out on Twitter. Right. So it may be a whole fucking game with Corker and that little bullshit that went on last week with him to get his intention in order to maybe, you know, hey, motherfucker, focus on what we got to get done. We got to get this tax care, this this tax right. cut shit done. So that's why I say, you know, there's there's a second part to that. Don't be baffled by the bullshit. Doesn't mean you then ignore the bullshit. You still have to pay attention. Just don't be baffled by it. Like, understand the bullshit. So if you pay, uh, uh, you know, look past the headlines on the Iran deal, and then you'll see underneath it is, what is he actually going to get done with this? What, you know, so it ultimately, if you follow it, you see, well, he's going to do nothing. It's just a bunch of crap that he ran his mouth on for a couple of years. And he had to kind of make good on having run his mouth on it. So he did. But really the agenda is, subjugating the masses of humanity to facilitate the power and wealth of uh, uh, an elite class. And, Corporations. You know, yeah, capitalist, man. Imperialist fucking capitalist. That's exactly it. And, I, you know, it sounds so 1920s, 1930s, 19, 1920s, 2000s, conspiracy theory, bullshit, whatever, right? But, dude, it's fucking true. I just said they check every box on the fascism checklist. Maybe. This is pure and simple corporate capitalistic fucking fascism and then so okay look and that actually is a good setup we're gonna play this video right now i made it um last night and um it's really just kind of um i i kind of um vomited artistic expression onto youtube but it actually has some informative substance in it too but it's it's a little bit about sort of um how the christian coalition it was at a central key figure in sort of facilitating what we now recognize as these Christo fascists and these alt right, God hates fags type movement, right? Um, so um, this video kind of sets it up, and um, and then we'll come back and we'll kind of um, break it down a little, little bit and discuss it a little better. Right, but but let's right. go ahead and play that. Reverend Aaron's artistic vomit. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but it's it this video is called it's Christian. Co it's called Christian. It's called Christian Coalition um, Heresy of the Christo Fascists. Let's okay, check let's check it out. Coalition Executive Director Ralph Reed. We felt that with the roughly 1,900,000 households that Pat Robertson came out of his presidential campaign with on computer tape, about 175,000 of those identified as activists and prime donors, that there was a built in base to build a new pro family uh, Christian organization in this country. The question is how will we accomplish it? And that's where we get to this five fold strategy. It's a five-fold strategy that if we execute this in the coming 10 years, we will be the most powerful political force in American politics. The first is a grassroots strategy. We're going to have the nation divided up into seven, seven state regions. And in each of those regions, we're going to have a full-time, paid, trained, professional regional director. They will be responsible for training activists in their region, interfacing with candidates at the local, state, and federal level, and mobilizing people at the grassroots. Each of those regional directors in each of those seven states will have 10 top counties, targets, where they have to organize down into the precincts by the next election. on the neck and go for the kill. Yes, we good Christians, we can do that too. When you get your opponent, when you start getting one more crap, one more weakness, you do not let up. At that point, you go for the juggler. What is the Christian Coalition? Is it a religious or a political organization? 
Well, it's a public issues organization um, organized under uh, the... That wasn't one of the choices I gave. Oh, you didn't do the public issues. Well, it's, it's, it's a crossover. It does uh, uh, political things uh, from a religious uh, point of view. The purpose of creationism is to destroy the possibility of dispassionate, honest, intellectual, and scientific inquiry. It is, it is to make facts interchangeable with opinion. It is to make lies true. And that is a dangerous precedent to set because then you are allowed to view the world and the reality around you through this distorted ideological prism. That's what's being done. It's a war against truth. It's a war against uh, real intellectual inquiry. It's a war against science. Uh, and, and that, of course, is a fundamental component to the fascist state or the totalitarian state. Because in order for these movements to take power, they need a prolonged period of instability or crisis. And remember that there are tens of millions of people in the United States who've been completely disenfranchised with the flight of manufacturing jobs and, and, and have fallen into a level of despair. And these people, in their despair and their rage, have turned to a world where they're offered magic and angels and Jesus will walk with them, and they've been ripe for manipulation by these demagogues. I mean, you don't see anything wrong with, for example, picketing the funeral of an AIDS victim? Best time in the world to pick up those creatures. That's when they're paying close attention to you. That's dying time is truth time. They've been living lives based on lies. They died deaths based on lies. It's cruelty to stand around their dead bodies and preach no lies. Good morning, I'm Barbara Brown. Breaking news at this hour from Orlando, where there are reports of a shooting at a nightclub in that city. Every side of my Japan. Every single one, you know, it's an unnatural shit. It's unnatural to want to be with someone of the same sex. Today, you know, people say, like, well, aren't you sad that 50 saw to my side? Here's the problem with that. It's like the equivalent of asking me, you know, what if you ask me, hey, are you sad that 50 pedophiles were killed today? Um, no, I think that's great. The good news is that there's 50 less pedophiles in this world because, you know, these homosexuals are a bunch of disgusting perverts and pedophiles. That's who was a victim here, are a bunch of just disgusting homosexuals at a gay bar, okay? His cousin said Ron came out to his family just this year. He was afraid they might not accept him, but they did. They embraced his boyfriend as well. He was 22. Christopher Andrew Lee, known, known as Drew, he was uh, Ron's boyfriend, and his mom says he established the Gay Straight Alliance at his high school. He was 32 years old. You know, I think Orlando, Florida is a little safer tonight. Now that 50, you know, the tragedy is that more of them have died. I mean, the tragedy is, I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of upset that he didn't finish the job. Well, I begin the book with uh, a short list written by the writer Umberto Echo, where he lists what he thinks are the 14 points of eternal fascism or er fascism, that cult of masculinity. Uh, that war against modernism, that war against truth, that mm -hmm. obsession with apocalyptic violence as a purging agent or cleansing agent, uh, you know, to make the world pure and usher in the utopia. Uh, and I think when you, when you look closely at the ideology of the radical Christian right, those uh, so-called Christians in the United States who want to create a Christian state, in generic terms, uh, they're fascist. Certainly fascism conjures up historical images, as you saw, you know, pictures of Mussolini or Hitler, but it is an ideological belief system. And that's certainly the argument of the book, that this has been a dangerous mutation. These are not traditional evangelicals. They're not traditional fundamentalists who have always called on followers to remove themselves from the contaminants of secular society to shun political power. Evangelical leaders like Billy Graham always talked about not getting too close to power, and he himself was used and burned by Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. This is a dangerous and radical mutation. It is about creating, in, uh, using the iconography and language of Christianity to create an authoritarian, or, or I think arguably a fascist state. Now, We've shown ourselves guilty of one thing, of passionately entering into a conspiracy to uphold the First and Fourteenth Amendments. That was Mario Savio on October 16, 1964, right here on the steps of Sproul Plaza as he stood up against the exact same forces that are perverting his message to instill fascism in the United States. They have perverted the message of free speech and Mario Savio to sell this garbage and ignorant ill-informed fear and hatred. Okay, we're back.
back. That was um, that was good, Aaron. Good job on that. Well, it was fun. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed my um, artistic vomit on YouTube. But <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, you remember, Mike? I, I, I mean, I, I do remember, Aaron. I, I remember that this was a specific target. Um, and I don't remember how I, I heard this. I probably read an article, maybe in, in Rolling Stone magazine, about how the Republican Party, after they lost to Clinton, you know, wanted to figure out how they were going to. Because Clinton had all the young people at that time, remember? He was playing the sax on Arsenio Hall, and, and he had the young vote, rock the vote on MTV and shit. And so the Republicans were trying to figure out a way to counter that. And they decided they were going to go to the christian coalition they were going to go to the right-wing christian you know <laughs> family <laughs> values I, I mean didn't even i i wasn't it bush quail that was running on family values that was the first bush as i recall well this is so this is what's going on is um this is you know the young republicans which is where carl rove came out of jack abramoff you know the co the college republicans bro the same right, group right. that's bringing Milo and uh, Ann Coulter and all these people to Berkeley these days. Um, directly the same group, college Republicans. But so they, they come out of sort of the late 70s, and, and they're, they're these sort of far-right wingers who were really repulsed by the whole anti-war movement and all the, the civil rights movement in the 60s, and they're sort of a, a backlash of it. And so Ralph Reed says he sees sort of um, – Though Pat Robertson failed miserably, he got his ass handed to him in, in his presidential run. What Ralph Reed saw was, wow, there was there, he actually does have a really strong core constituency of people who are really loyal to him. And he thought, if I can co-op that base of people and get them steered towards the Republican Party, and if I can get the Republican Party to shift its gears a little bit to cater to this group— Ultimately, deciding the um, the agenda for that group. I mean, you know, they start out by sort of catering to them, and then ultimately starts handing down the talking points, which is what happens. So this solidifies. It's building under Reagan's administration, but by the time Bush comes along, Bush Jr., like you said, after the Clintons kind of take office, that's when the Republican Party went, "Hey, man, this whole Christian coalition thing is Ralph Reed thing going on over here." It, at that point, really embraced it. And, you know, and Bush Jr., he gets, quote unquote, saved. And all of a sudden he's got this Christian rhetoric in his stump speeches and shit. So he completely embraces the Christian coalition and, and you know, wins based on that core group. And now that core group, that Christian coalition inspired this next generation that's come up that was raised on this sort of soup of – um you know, like you see where Pat Robertson talks about in that video, he's like, well, it's a political group with religious ideologies. Well, they were kind of figuring out who they were then. Now they've got it. It's this very libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, Christian fascist manifestation. Like Chris Hedges said, it's not your typical um, evangelical community. This is not the community. That, you know, I remember, bro, when being – Christian didn't mean you were a Republican. There were lots of Christians uh, in Yeah, the, maybe. I mean, it changed a lot with the Southern strategy and Nixon, and it became obviously, you know, leaning more towards it. But there was still, I remember there always being in the church when I was a kid, the, the pockets of liberals. There were people who were liberals in my church growing up, dude. Well, my parents were... were... I would call them Reagan Democrats. My mom and dad were both registered Democrats, but I know for a fact they voted for Nixon. I know they voted for um, for Reagan. I used to fight my mom and I talk shit on her all the time about it, you know. Um, and I can't tell you, dude, any of my friends that I grew up with that are in the church, um, none of my church friends that I know today, none of them are liberal. All of them are all of them are, are, are Republican. My my relatives that are in the church, they're all Republicans. My it's cousin, like, I love her to death. Is, she doesn't get it, and she's a Republican because her family is Republican. Her dad is a Republican, and I'm like, oh, honey. so Nixon, he, what he did, Nixon puts in the Southern strategy, and he co-ops all, all the far right 
wing, total racist, hardcore racist people. And then Ralph Reed and the Christian Coalition comes along 20 years later and adds to that core constituency the far right wing religious nuts. So now that's what the Republican Party is. That's how you get a Donald Trump is you combine these far right wing people who will follow a Pat Robertson and the and the establishment sort of evangelical line and not question it because it's of God. How and then does... Pat Robertson says, OK, if you want to be of God, you got to support Donald Trump. Uh, but Aaron, Reverend, so... talk, talk to me as 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 a man of God, bro. <laughs> How can anybody believe anything that comes out of Pat Robertson's mouth now? He talks so much long shit. He blamed the hurricanes on people that were hated on hated on Trump. And it's like, look, dude, his show is on Freeform TV, which is owned by Disney. Get it? I get it. Disney Family Values and that whole nine yards. Really? You need to cut this fucker off, man. I can't believe there's that he's actually got people that follow the pastors, him. The pastors in the churches um, are, are parroting the 700 Club line. The email chains that, that the members of these churches that, are set, that send each other back and forth is all – towing that line they become these people because they don't want to question things michael that's how you become a follower and so they're so 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 susceptible to authoritarian tyranny because they don't want to think for themselves they want someone to tell them what's right and what's safe and how to get into heaven oh oh okay just tell me what to do and i'll do it I just want to please God. What do I do? Well, if you want to please God, you vote for Trump. Oh, and don't believe all that stuff. That's the liberals lying to you. He's not a racist. Because they're afraid they're not going to make it into heaven? Oh, fucking no, because really? they're afraid of people. Bro. They want to be safe right now. They want to be safe right now. They don't want to die. It's not about the afterlife. I think that's but they're the gonna common go thing that they... a lot of a lot of a lot of critics um, will um, say about Christians and stuff is that it's all this um, obsession with the afterlife. I, I, I disagree with that. That's not my experience with the Christian community. They're afraid of their life right now. They want to be safe right now. And they don't want to die. And they don't want the big scary world that they understand because... to kill them. So if they do right by God, God will protect them and keep them safe because they are his flock and um, he because looks he's... at Coming his, down again the second time, and, and no, because he's there. His loyal followers today, they will protect him today. You have to understand, dude, that Jesus exists in their life right now. He's a living, breathing creature who speaks to them every day and is protecting them right now. So they do what their church tells them to do to please this Jesus entity that they believe in. Wow. And yes, if yes, it does facilitate. It does have the extra added payoff of an eternity in heaven and no hell. But people are afraid for their life right now. It, we um, we evolved from a primary thalamus-driven brain. We began as a fight-or-flight creature. Now we have our prefrontal cortex that lets us analyze whether we should fight or flight, and it helps us find nuance between those two choices. But that takes a little bit of effort. And lazy people don't want to take effort. They just want to be told whether they're... Exactly. Just tell me what to do. Don't you know, don't make me think about it. Don't make me try to figure it out for so myself. I mean, I have to be a good person just because I'm 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 supposed to be a good person. <laughs> Dude, good video. We get fascism. Thank you. Um, and that's actually the music in there is uh, reptilian shapeshifters. Uh, which is a project I did with Xtevion, a drummer from uh, Compulsion Airs, and our very good friend Kate Laurie, um, which was a project we were we attempted to launch a few years ago, like in 2012, and we got a bunch of really cool tracks recorded, and we kind of um, never did ultimately launch the project, but um, that's what that music is from. And um, so yeah, so the, there's we have other content up though, Mike. Right? We, You've been busy. I've been kind of busy. Yeah, you know my. I got a bunch of stuff on my phone still, and I put a little bit of up on our page. Um, I um, well, let me see. A couple of weeks ago, um, I decided to support um, Rash. Our friends from Rash put on a benefit show for disaster relief um, in LA. LA Punk Show for disaster relief. 
Red and anarchist skinheads. Is uh, right. And um, one of our followers, Jim, what is – what up, Jim? Lead singer of the band Total Massacre. Their band was playing. I'm like, I'm going to go. So I went and showed up. I got, uh, got, got to hang out with the band for a little while, and uh, I got us some video. And some pictures. Um, so check out the Total Massacre video that we have up there. Um, they did a great Tom Petty cover. <laughs> have you pulled that out yet? Oh, you wanted that one? No, I haven't done that. Because we're putting together a couple midweek music shows, too, that we're going to show we a got lot some, of this. Right. We got a bunch of music. And then that was a couple Fridays ago. And then this last weekend, um, well, then, see, Lexi, actually, let me, let me back up a little bit. That was two weekends ago. And that was, that was like, I think it was like a week ago, Saturday. And during the day, I went to Redlands Oktoberfest. And, yeah. and I put up a bunch of pictures of that um, on my Instagram. And then I put up a couple of videos um, on our YouTube page. Uh, so check that out. There was um, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly the Clacker Player. <laughs> oh, that dude is awesome, dude. I love those pictures. I know. That dude was awesome. Um, I had a really good time. It was all the local. We have four f- local. We have more than probably four, but there was four main local microbrews here in town, and they were all four there. Hangar Twenty Four, Ritual. Uh, my favorite was Escape. Um, and then there was oh yeah, pfft, yeah, Bud was there with their Michelob Ultra. Um, Escape Brewery had a beer called I'm gonna remember Social Disturbance. And I'm like, okay, yeah. and it was and it was an IPA, and I was like, okay, well, I was gonna have I was gonna have their blonde, which was called Token, Token Blonde. No, it was, God damn it, I can't remember now. <laughs> um, but I was like, okay, because the I name of it, I don't care what the flavor is. If it's Civil Disturbance, I'm gonna have to. Drink and see, that's that's how I was too. I'm like, I gotta try that. It's an IPA, and I don't like IPAs. IPAs are I've usually IPA an IPA is a hot, you know you know what an IPA is right. I don't like them too much. I don't either. So I, I asked her, it's like, I got to try this. I'm not an IPA guy, but I really got to try a, 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 a beer called Civil Disturbance. And she's like, well, it's hopped with a citrus hop. She might really like it. And she gave me a sample, and I was like, tastes fine. I said, it's not going to get me anything. Let me have one. So I, I grabbed I Dude, I, I was done at that point. That's what I'm drinking. And I had like two or three more of those, and I was done. So uh, shout out to Escape Brewery and Civil Disturbance. So that was awesomeness. And then I got to go down and hang out uh, with uh, my punk rock friends down in uh, East L.A. And, and support that and, and kick down. And then this last weekend, there was a show here in Highland um, that benefited St. Jude's Medical Center. Oh, hold on, hold on, Mike. Hold on, hold on. East L.A. friends, that, like explain that a little better. So you, Redlands bands, like so a lot of the – the bands that we do a lot of, that we cover a lot, right? We're playing in East LA. Is that no, what you're talking about? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about our friends Total Massacre played there, um, and there was a couple of other bands that played there. But I mean, our friends. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Our right, friends, right, right, yeah, our friends from Total Massacre, as well as our my new friends from Rash, um, right. LA. Um, gotcha. And yeah, um, and I'm trying to remember the other group down there, bro. That was a, that was that had the signs. It was kind of more of a main. A main group there, but I, I I don't recall off the top of my head. It's in the pictures, but um, yeah, so we made some new friends down there and made some uh, you know got got to know some people. It was very cool. So then this weekend was the uh, benefit show in Highland, and that was for the um, the Inland Empire bands that I normally go see the backyard shows. It was a backyard show. Um, it was like three bucks to get in. I handed the guy a twenty and said, "This is for cancer kids, right?" And he said, "Yeah." I'm like, "Okay, we're good." Okay, man. Thanks. I'm like, well, yeah, dude. I'm like, give me, give, give him the opportunity. I'm not going to send a check for twenty bucks to St. Jude Medical Center because I saw some sorry ass ad on TV, but I, I just not. But if I can go to a show down the street and kick the guy fifty or you know twenty, I gave him twenty. It's all I had. I gave him a twenty, and and then I, of course I bought stuff when I was there to help support the people that were putting the show on. But um, do you know I can support local bands. I can support a, you know a good cause. Uh, I, I'm down, and you know Foolish Johns were there. I love those guys to death, and I got to check out. Oh, and Archer, my buddy's Archer. Keep an eye out for them. I'm going to do an interview with Archer. So I love those guys. Cool. Just a great group of 
guys. <laughs> I really uh, like Archer O's music too. Yeah, no, cool, way cool kids. I got to meet them at your birthday bash, and right. way cool kids. And I, I really do like. They're one of my favorites out of that whole sort of clique of bands uh, in the Inland Empire that you've been chilling with. I, I right, really do and like. I got to tell you, I got to hang with the Foolish Johns for a little bit, and those guys are just a good group of guys, man. Every time I'll see them once in a while sure. at a show, they're not playing at, and I'm like. Hey, Big John, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I got turned on to this other band called Barote the Musical. And I was completely impressed with them. My son says, dude, you got to check him out. The guy plays stand-up bass. And I'm like, okay, I'm hooked. I love stand-up bass. Uh, I, I, that'd be really cool. So I go, they come on and I go check them out. It's kind of dark. The video's not real super great. Uh, you know, I got right in front and down low. So you, I'm kind of looking up at him a little bit. But... Yeah. Um, the guy just beats the shit out of the stand-up bass. And then the guitar player whips out a trumpet and starts <laughs> wailing on this trumpet. And I was like, okay, this is just fantastic. Kind of reminded me a little bit of, of like Violent Femmes-esque type stuff, that mm -hmm. avant-garde, sure. KSBC, like mid-80s style, you know, college radio stuff that you listen to. Sure. I loved it. I loved it. So I'm definitely down for those guys. I picked up their EP, um, you know, gave them a little bit of money and uh, – you know, so check that video cool. out. Definitely check that. video. I don't know what the hell the name of the song is. I have no freaking clue. It's just up as Barote the Musical, right? Yeah, Barote the Musical. No idea what the hell that means. So, <laughs> but I just well, yeah. So that's that's good videos. Good and, then, and then um, now, so check this out. Uh -huh. Um, you know the Set Blasters that played at uh, at my punk rock birthday show. Um, yeah. one of those guys rolled by the house today and, and dropped me off two tickets. To go see them and the Dickies at the Whiskey this weekend. Yeah, badass, dude. Yeah, so awesome. I will have I will have video. I will post that flyer. You can find it on my Instagram, Mike underscore Punker. You can find it on Punks for Progress on Facebook. I'll put it on the Twitter, Punks the number four Progress. I have to find it somewhere, but I'll find it. I'm sure it's on the, <laughs> I'm sure it's on the Set Blasters Instagram. Sure. I'll, I'll have to work on getting us a Punks for Progress Instagram. Let me see what I can do about that. Okay. Yeah, we need that shit. Um, so then I um, w there was a gig I went to and put a video up to this week. So um, we were ask asked to help out and help um, put on the um, Books for Prisoners benefit show um, at Eli's Mile High Club. Which, um, oh, yeah. Um, so it was Angry Johnny. Who's uh, What's up, Angry Johnny? Um, Who is going to be doing a lot more stuff in the future with punks for progress um that I'm really excited about and we'll tell you more about that in coming weeks but um uh so angry johnny put on the thing he asked us to participate and help him and so we did and he well, we were able to table there and he asked me to give a a, a short talk which i did and and uh there was a bunch of different bands and there's a full video up that we have up it's about 30 minutes and there's great artists live painting going on and so i was able to get good coverage of uh, the art that was available there and um ultimately bro um raised in the neighborhood of about 1200 bucks for books for prisoners so what it is is ak wow. press um has this program called friends of prisoners you can find it on their um um uh website akpress.com and um um so yeah they they um, provide all of this sort of these books that are published by um, AK Press. Um, they provide it to prisoners. They give them free to prisoners. So what it is is this: it's not that it necessarily buys books because basically the um, you know AK Press gets their books pretty cheap since they're the ones who publish their books. <laughs> um, but this money <laughs> goes to facilitating works. that whole process. You know, so it's not it's there's so many books that this $1,200 can provide. It's not like it, it buys a, a whole bunch of $30 books. It's going to provide way more than that because it just facilitates the whole process. So it's really, really, really great that we got to kind of contribute and help out for this, um, to raise that much money for such an amazing, amazing, reputable cause. So I was really stoked to be able to participate in that and to be able to give a speech. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, show you guys the talk that I gave. It's about 10 minutes. It's what I gave at the event. So um, so we'll show that. And then we mentioned this earlier in the show, but then there's another like kind of uh, four or five minute video that we're going to throw in after that. That's really amazing from um, the Equal Justice Initiative. Kind of about, it, it, you'll see, it really um, kind of expounds on what my talk was on. So um, 
You know, why don't are, we do that, Mike? We'll we show gonna, them the, uh, my talking yeah. books for prisoners, and then um, go ahead. I was going to say, are we going to come back, or is that it? No, I think that would be good. We can just tell people, you know, make sure to like, you know, like our shit on Facebook and share our stuff on Facebook, and then um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I don't please. care if they like our shit or uh, not. They can subscribe. I'm down for that. Well, they don't have to like our shit. <laughs> Share well, the hell like out of it. it. Well, if you like it and share it, it helps get that out to more people because when you like something, it shows up in your feed and it shows the people in your friends list that you liked this thing. So it helps spread our radical leftist <laughs> message Agenda. In, in doing so. So it's not just to make us feel I know. good because you like something. It is um, to make but, us uh, feel good. We don't care. I don't care. I don't care if you like us. I don't care if you like me. Don't follow me. Don't follow me. But also, we set up our Patreon account. So we actually have a Patreon account, and we want to um, wow. bring you guys better gear and get better um, content for you guys. Come on, look so at look at like look at Aaron's patron, vomit. That would be amazing. Look how good Aaron <laughs> we did could with do that better vomit. than that. Right. I I mean, mean, imagine if we had better software and stuff, man. And, well, we've so. got one. We've got one so far. One subscriber. So check us out on Patreon. Punks for progress. Excellent. Punks the number four progress on the Twitter. Punks for Progress on Facebook. Mike underscore Punker on Instagram. Reverend Aaron's Church of Cannabis. No, that's has not <laughs> <laughs> um, Keep that. an eye open for um, some music shows coming up. We might even work on one tonight. Yeah, we'll do that. We're going to do another Halloween show. I know we talked about it last week. We actually got it all, all the stuff compiled yeah. and we're ready to put it together. We're going to play so gonna... videos. You know, we, we know how to do this now. <laughs> we're going right. to actually play the videos for the song. So our Puncture Progress stupid video, Halloween video show. Mikey gets to be a VJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole reason all this shit is so that he can announce songs on the air and be a... Pretend, you know. that, pretend I'm a radio DJ. He grew up on FM radio, man. What can you say? <laughs> Right, AM yeah, radio. Yeah, I love you, bro. I'm a uh, good I show. Love you, too, man. Love you. And um, so stick around. Please watch this uh, talk I gave the Books for Prisoners event and then stick around for it after that because this Equal Justice Initiative video is freaking awesome. It is. And the it's artwork really good. is super cool. So check uh, that out. And, and then, um, yeah, we'll see you next week. All right. Peace out, guys. I promise I'm going to try not to bore you too much, but I want to talk a little bit about like what this is all about. And so this little quick talk is called America's Unbroken and Ongoing History of Slavery. So I'm going to start out by reading a little piece I wrote while I was uh, a slave myself with the Nevada Department of Corrections. It's called Holding Pattern. For all my life, I have had a deep-seated, desperate desire, nay, compulsion, to stretch myself out as a conduit to the vast voice of the all things, thereby conducting it all into formulaic scratches onto slivers of wood such as this one. But now I've been made to succumb to the clamp down, Orwell's boot to the lockdown neck, caged and constricted within the confines of criminal comforts, which are no comforts at all. The weapons of oppression blindsiding my mind's eye, stamping out a weaker man's inclination to try. But not I. I will lower my lids only to awaken the ability to fly. High! Very, very high! A blinding fucking firework in the night side! Ablaze with the pyres of this moment's strife. Finally let loose an inexplicably brilliant life. Only that, the one that only I am so fucking awesome as to try. In time, in time, my temporary cry. Thank you. Now this is called, uh, uh, preserving slavery has always been the primary preoccupation of rich, white, American capitalist men. And uh, let's take a look at the Second Amendment, right? Now look, everyone likes the First Amendment, but the Second Amendment, I think we'd all agree, is a fucking shit show, right? Now, we talk a lot about how the Second Amendment is all about sort of uh, making sure you can protect yourself in your home or protect yourself from the government. It's bullshit. 
The Second Amendment is about the preservation of slavery. Let's take a look at what it says. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So I'm going to refer you, just this week, Raw Story put out a real fucking wonderful piece called The Second Amendment Was Ratified to Preserve Slavery. In that article, they quote Sally E. Hayden, author of Slave Patrols, Law and Violence in Virginia and the Carolinas. She says in this article, although eligibility for the militias seemed all-encompassing, not every middle-aged white male Virginian or Carolinian became a slave patrol. Notice the interchange of the words militia and slave patrol. Remember what the Second Amendment says about the well-regulated militia. She goes on to say, most Southern men between ages 18 to 45, including physicians and ministers, had to serve on slave patrols in their lives. So the security of a free state was protected by inscription in the militia slave patrols. What we now refer to as the police. Right? That's right, because a direct line of connection can be made between the militias and the slave patrols to our modern police force. And we ended up fighting a fucking civil war over it. So let's talk about what happened with the Civil War, right? We got the 13th Amendment. Let's take a look at that. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party having been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, blah, blah, blah. Slavery was never abolished. It was transformed into... Uh, a prison system, child slavery. It's what we refer to as the exception clause of the 13th Amendment. Except as punishment for a crime where the party, the party having been duly convicted. And then what happens the second that the 13th Amendment is ratified, there's a massive sea change in the militias and the slave patrols. They go from rounding up free, uh, escaped slaves and checking on them in their slave camps and in their homes and went about the business of, you know, arresting them for loitering or spitting on the street and then returning them to their slavery. And it's at this point, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment, that the police force becomes what we recognize now. They began to have uniforms, they had government funding, and that's the inception of our police force in that moment. And let me tell you another massive sea change that happened. Within a year of the ratification of the 13th Amendment, prison populations, which were 90% male population, within a year went to 90% black male population. Slavery has never ended in the United States. So then we have, and then they institute all the Jim Crow laws and this new transformation of slavery, right? So then we have the whole civil rights movement in the 60s and we get the Civil Rights Bill enacted. So the Nixon administration goes into full force at that point and institutes the Southern strategy. Racist dog whistling, consolidation of the Republican Party into a Southern constituency. The trend of Confederate statue erections goes into full effect all over the South. The drug war connects blacks to heroin and the radical left to marijuana, and both drugs are heavily criminalized. And the COINTEL pro program goes into full effect, and the FBI begins targeting African-American groups organizing, and check this shit out. The first time that the police were militarized, the first time that SWAT was used, the inception of SWAT was put into effect to shut down the LA chapter of the Black Panthers. Slave patrols. So then we, kept, we fast forward. Reagan kicks the war on drugs, war on drugs into overdrive, right? CIA, which is you know George Bush, starts importing massive amounts of cocaine and crack and floods it into already poverty-stricken and marginalized communities, so that we can continue to lock people up in prisons and continue the slave trade. Clinton comes along, right? He comes along and he signs his massive crime bill with the streets, free strikes law. Prison population skyrocket. 
we now have more people currently in prisons, slaves, than any other nation in the world, and in the known history of the world. And I'm going to say this one more thing before I read my last little poem and let you get back to something fun like music, and I thank you so much for putting up my shit. But on average, in the United States, someone who is in, who, sitting in a prison generates anywhere from fifty to eighty thousand dollars in profits for one company or another. And I'll tell you this as an old fucking punk rocker: I don't know that I've ever made more than twenty-seven thousand dollars in one year in my life. And I got me a nice Fred Perry and a nice pair of Ben Sherman shoes, and I'm not doing so bad. But I don't understand how fifty thousand dollars is justified for someone sitting in a fucking cell as a slave. I don't get that. Except that it's slavery. Mm -hmm. And it's what America has always been built on. And I wrote this piece the day before I got let out of, of my chains of slavery. Before I got my name back from 109642. This is called Strength in Spite of Time. While I can't see any good reason for having been here, I shall so love every breath and hail as I pass its foul gate. Though I have been so tested as to endure all that should cause a wise man to fear, I have stood steadfast, endured, and shown all that I am able to take. No good man should ever have occasion to comprehend this terrible chapter. Nor should man of black heart be forced into such terms of uselessness. For while good men will still incline to find good occasion for laughter, so shall no evil men be spurred by these confines to shift heels towards usefulness. This is time, not well served but utterly wasted. This is crime, not in good cause but tomfoolery hastened. No grand cause has been served here. No poor victim rightly recompensed. No lesson learned but to revel in ephemeral moments long left behind in the wake of this ugly, ugly reality. This school lesson less evil. This time, this crime of time. Wasted for no good reason I have yet to stumble upon. And know this, for I shall know it for all my life to follow. No crime can be undone by time, when such time is itself a crime, not so unlike any other committed over all time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 In 1619, when the first Africans were brought to the British colonies by ship to Jamestown, Virginia, they held the legal status of servant. But as the region's economic system became increasingly dependent on forced labor, we descended into slavery. The institution of American slavery developed as a permanent, hereditary system centrally tied to race. Millions of black people were forcibly taken from Africa crammed on ships and brought to the Americas through a dangerous and deadly journey that crossed the Atlantic. Millions died. Once on our shores, slavery deprived the enslaved person of any legal rights or autonomy and granted the slave owner complete power over the black men, women, and children legally recognized as property. An ideology of white supremacy, a narrative of racial difference was created to rationalize and justify the continuation of slavery. American slavery was often brutal, barbaric, and violent. In addition to the hardship of forced labor, enslaved people were maimed or killed by slave owners as punishment for working too slowly, visiting a spouse living on another plantation, or even learning to read. Enslaved people were also sexually exploited. The United States Congress finally banned the importation of slaves from Africa in 1808. Slavery was widely considered a gross human rights violation, yet enslavement was retained and persisted. The 1808 Declaration caused the demand for slave labor to skyrocket in the Lower South, and the domestic slave trade grew to meet this demand. 
Between 1808 and 1860, the enslaved population of Alabama grew from less than 40,000 to more than 435,000. Slave traders chained African Americans together in coffles and forced them to march hundreds of miles from the Upper South to the Lower South. Steamboats carried slaves along the Alabama River. Rail routes constructed with slave labor brought hundreds of enslaved people to Montgomery, Alabama every day, turning the city into one of the largest slave trading communities in the United States. Enslaved people would be paraded up Commerce Street to slave warehouses and slave depots. The city's slave market was at the Artesian Basin, now known as Court Square. Enslaved people of all ages were auctioned along with livestock, standing in line to be inspected. Public posters advertising the sale of slaves included gender, age, skill, complexion, owner's name, and price. Slavery in America traumatized and devastated millions of people. Husbands and wives, parents and children could not protect themselves from being sold away from each other. Enslaved families were separated at an owner's or auctioner's whim, never to see each other again. The domestic slave trade separated nearly half of all enslaved people from their spouses and parents. In 1833, the Alabama legislature banned free black people from residing in the state, meaning that enslavement was the only legally authorized status for African Americans. Even as the Civil War raged, slave trading in Montgomery flourished well into the mid-1860s. After the Confederacy's surrender in 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which prohibited slavery nationwide except as a punishment for crime. But in many former slave states, slavery did not end. It simply evolved. Southern whites, angry after losing the war, targeted black people who were largely abandoned by the federal government in the 1870s. For decades, black men, women, and children were tortured, terrorized, and killed by mobs and violent lynchings, oppressed by a system of racist laws and customs. For another 100 years, black people were racially segregated, denied the right to vote, education, and basic dignity. They were humiliated, beaten, or killed for minor offenses or for protesting. The civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s helped to end legally authorized racial segregation, but racial bias still persists. Today, a presumption of guilt is assigned to many people of color who are disproportionately arrested, convicted of crimes, and sent to prison. African Americans are six times more likely to be sentenced to prison for the same crime as a white person. One in three black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. Police violence against black people is so epidemic that civil rights demonstrations have shut down cities across the U.S. as thousands of people march to protest police brutality. Many states celebrate the era of slavery with Confederate holidays and by honoring the defenders and architects of slavery while ignoring the history of enslavement. The Equal Justice Initiative believes that racial bias remains a serious problem and is a direct and lasting legacy of American slavery and our failure to deal with the history of racial injustice. The Equal Justice Initiative seeks to foster an honest conversation about the legacy of slavery, about mass incarceration, and racial inequality, and how it still affects millions of people today. We can confront and overcome bias and discrimination. Please join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. <laughs>